Good morning, and thank you for joining us today, Thursday, December 3rd, 2020, for our webinar entitled New Laws for a New Year, 19, uh, 2021, sorry, <laughs> presented by Ethos Human Capital Solutions and Merhab Robinson and Clarkson Corporation. My name is Denise Ketty, and I am your moderator for this session. A couple of quick housekeeping notes before we introduce the topic and expert panel. Our webinar is being recorded, and all attendees are in listen-only mode. The webinar will run approximately 60 minutes in total. Please take a moment now to visit the handouts area on the GoToMeeting toolbar to download a copy of today's presentation. If you don't see a handouts area, click on the toolbar to enable the handouts area, and then you should be able to download the presentation. If you have questions during the presentation, please post them in the Q&A area on the dashboard at any time during the presentation. If you would like your question directed to a specific panelist, you can note that when you're sending in your question. Just a quick reminder that today's webinar is being recorded and all accompanying materials are protected by copyright. The presentation today provides general information and does not constitute legal advice. The information is offered during this webinar is as of today, December 3rd, 2020, because we know things are changing on a regular basis. So. Um, as always, we recommend that you consult with your own legal counsel to address your specific situation to ensure that you have the most current information on legal matters. Let's get right into it. 2020 has been a challenging year for employers of all sizes and across all industries throughout the year. New laws and orders regarding COVID-19 have emerged regularly, leaving employers to comply immediately with little or no notice. While COVID-19 continues to dominate the headlines, and laws, there are also several new developments in employment law this year unrelated to the pandemic that will impact business owners. Our legal expert today is Curtis Uryan, associate at the law firm of Murhab Robinson Clarkson Law Corporation. In the firm's transactional department where he advises clients in real estate, finance, business succession planning, corporate and employment law. In addition to Curtis's Outstanding work at the firm, he has contributed articles to law journals and is a part-time lecturer and teaches classes on economics, conscious capitalism, and business law, among others. Curtis has been recognized as a rising star in Southern California every year beginning in 2017 through, most recently, 2020. Um, and only 2.5% of the attorneys in Southern California are selected as rising stars, so congratulations to our friend Curtis once again. Our human capital expert is Linda Duffy, president of Ethos Human Capital Solutions. Linda and her team are known for building the magic of the human connection with their unique approach to HR consulting, recruiting, training, and payroll support programs. The Ethos team works with your company by developing strategies for your business leaders to get the right systems, people, and culture in place with your organization so that you, as a business owner, can focus on running your business and achieving your goals. I'm gonna turn it over to Linda right now so she can get us started. Denise, thanks so much. Um, appreciate you showing up today. Um, hope everybody's safe out there with the fire and everything in Orange County anyway. Um, so as usual, we apply for HRCI credit for these. So for those of you that have a certification um, through HRCI, um, or SHRM for that matter, if you want to just drop HRCI into um, the Q&A section, it will get recorded and we're happy to send you a certificate um, of attendance for today. We did apply, we didn't receive the approval yet, but all that means is you're gonna have to enter the information manually as opposed to just putting in like the code. Um, so if you do have uh, the need for any sort of recertification credit uh, for HR, just go ahead and put that in the chat and we'll we'll take care of that and follow up with you later. So our agenda is long today as always and I can judge just by the sheer number of attendees because um, it's still climbing and we're at 168 people right now so this is always one of our most popular webinars each year and this year I'm sure a lot of you are here for COVID because we are going to spend probably half the webinar going through different um, laws regarding COVID, they change on a literally daily basis. And so trying to keep up with that is difficult. Um, there are other things that are important, just a few things that people on, on the webinar need to know about are things like, you know, independent contractors. One of the big changes is CFRA 
um, and what's going on with that. So we're going to be talking about that. There's some other things as well, and we'll go through, and of course, and with our reminder about harassment prevention training. <clears throat> Okay, so let's jump right into it with COVID. Um, unlike how we most we usually do our webinars, Curtis and I are going to sort of tag team back and forth on these slides today. Uh, so we're going to try to make it a little bit more conversational, but at the same time not talk over one another. Uh, but let's just let me just start by just talking about some just general thoughts and concerns about COVID-19. Um, one thing we always have to remember is that we have to play by the highest, or in this case, the most stringent standard that somebody imposes. Right, so we're constantly struggling to stay up to date on this um, for clients because you've got different agencies at the federal level, the state level. You have to look at county. Orange County rules are different from Los Angeles, right? Los Angeles just got sort of locked down again last week, right? There's different city rules. Like I live in Santa Ana. Santa Ana just came out with their own mask policy, or they're about to. Um, so you have to always look at all of these. If you're in a building that you don't own. You may have requirements imposed on you by the building itself. If you're unionized, you're going to have maybe different requirements there. And then, of course, you can have your own company policies. Those are just the ones I could come up with off the top of my head last night. Um, but that's a list of the type of things we're constantly looking at. So I'll get calls from clients saying, oh, I just heard, you know, that, you know, uh, the governor just said we don't have to wear masks anymore or something like that, right? And I go, oh, but you're in Irvine. Irvine still has a requirement right? So you constantly have to look and always play by the strictest standard possible. Um, the other thing just to keep in mind is, you know, we're going to go through the things you have to do when you have employees at work, but I'm just going to say, as I do on all of my COVID webinars that I've done so far this year, have people stay home if at all possible. There are certain industries like the restaurant industry and other hospitality, things like that, manufacturing, you can't do that, right? People can't run machines from home or th things like that. But for people that are working in the office environments, a lot of times you can have those people work from home or even in a manufacturing company, maybe you can have some office staff work at home. The, the better we you know, distance ourselves from one another right now, the easier it's going to be to get this pandemic um, under control. And I know Curtis is going to jump in here now and talk about this as well, but we're both seeing a huge increase in the number of calls we're getting from clients again, saying, I've got a positive you know, test. I had an employee exposed. I have an employee with symptoms. Like, what do I do? And we're seeing that a lot right now. Yeah, thank you, Linda. I'm happy to jump in here. I just want to echo what you said about uh, just COVID not going away. So uh, this is a, a screenshot of a uh, website of Fisher Phillips. Fisher Phillips is a big insurance employer defense firm, and they maintain this COVID-19 uh, lawsuit case tracker. It's not an infection case tracker. It's a lawsuit case tracker. And I find it interesting to pull it up every once in a while. But a couple things I, I, I noticed yesterday when I pulled it up, uh, California has the most lawsuits. Go figure. It may be the most popular state, but it's also the <clears throat> pardon, strictest state. When it, excuse me. Pardon, I apologize. It's the most strictest state when it comes to employer liability. The, 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 the deck is proverbially stacked against California when it comes to employers. Also, if you look at the types of cases that are being filed, you'll see that the three most common types are employment discrimination, uh, remote work or leave conflicts, and retaliation. This whole year, we've been I've been receiving calls from clients on a consistent basis where an employee has a complaint about working conditions or has a complaint about leave or has a complaint about uh, risks of exposure and hazards. And I get the call, and I've even predicted the calls. One time I had a client call and say, you know, I've got a problem. And I responded and said, oh, is it about a COVID complaint? And the client said, yeah, how do you know? Well, it's, it's, just, it's just the news right now. It's, it's what we're seeing. And back when all of this started, March and April time, we, we did not get clear guidance from Cal OSHA on what employers should do with regards to workspaces that are open for employees, with regards to safety and, and protection measures. We did get guidance from the CDC 
And we got guidance from the big OSHA, but nothing specific for California. Back in April, uh, Cal OSHA took the stance that every employer knows their risks best themselves and that every employer would be required to identify their own hazards and establish their own pre preventative and protection measures and establish their own protocols, plans, and controls. And that's a very conservative approach. And I was actually kind of surprised when I saw that from Cal OSHA. But as you can see from the, the graphic here, uh, those regulations didn't really work. Employers uh, have not been very good at policing themselves. And so now we're in a regulatory regime where last week, Cal OSHA came out with a new emergency regulation on the preventative measures and programs that employers must adopt in California. So before we, this the last eight months, we went from a regulatory regime of police yourselves, uh, that's not really working. So now we're in a new regulatory regime with strict guidelines. And that's what I want to spend the bulk of my time talking about here right now. These, this is a regulation. It's from OSHA and regulation has the effect of law. It's been adopted and it has been approved. This regulation applies to all California employers. There are no exemptions. There are certain situations, situations, yes, for unions and hospitals where the guidelines are a little different. But in all of their contexts, all of their employers, this regulation applies to all employers, regardless of size, regardless of industry. And the biggest component of this new regulation is each employer must have a written COVID-19 prevention program. Before, Cal OSHA said, well, each employer, as you're policing yourself, if you identify that COVID as a hazard for your workplace, you should adopt a plan. Adopt a a plan and integrate it into your illness and injury prevention plan. That guideline kind of didn't get out. COVID or Cal OSHA wasn't too, uh, did not do a good job of making sure that that requirement got out. So many times when I get calls from clients saying, hey, we've got a problem, we've got a complaint, I would ask, okay, so what does your written plan say? And I get the question almost 100% of the time, what written plan? So now it is law, each employer must adopt a written COVID-19 prevention program. And the Cal OSHA has identified 10 elements or 10 areas that must be covered in each uh, COVID-19 prevention program. I call these the 10 commandments of COVID. So when we're talking about the, the Cal OSHA new regulation, there's, there's a few definitions of some of the terms that I want to just cover real quick because these are a little bit different than what we've seen from the CDC or from Big OSHA. So the new regulation defines a COVID-19 case as anyone who has tested positive for COVID-19, actually gotten a test and tested positive, anyone who is subject to an isolation order from the state or local government, an example of an isolation order might be if you travel interstate, you are you would be required to isolate for 14 days. Uh, so far in California, we have isolation recommendations, but not orders. But at any time, we could see isolation orders. Third example is if somebody uh, has died from COVID-19. A COVID exposure, specifically is being within six feet of a COVID-19 case for a cumulative total of 15 minutes or greater in any 24-hour period without regard for face coverings. So this is it again, a COVID-19 exposure is 15 or minutes, 15 or more minutes within six feet of somebody who's tested positive regardless of face coverings. And that's Curtis, a little bit broader. A, and that's a change from the original CDC definition as well, right? Yeah. Because the CDC, and the CDC, I think, changed it recently, but it used to be, it was 15 minutes sort of like at a time, 
right? And so clients would say to me, oh, they just like, you know, they just go up there periodically, but they only stay for a minute. Okay, but they do that 25 times a day, right? Correct. So this is yeah, cumulative, so cumulative, which is important, yeah. Cumulative, yeah, this is, this is new, this is different from what the CDC had said before. And it's w without regard to face coverings. All right, COVID-19 hazard is any potentially infectious material that may contain the virus. This is extremely broad. Any infectious material that may contain the, the virus. It could be your, your hands, you don't shake hands. It could be your face mask. It could be desk. It could be doorknobs. It could be windows. It could be tabletops. Any kind of surface that may contain the virus. Extremely broad definition. And exposed workplace is any work location, working area, common area that has been accessed or used by a COVID-19 case. This includes, includes your break areas, your hallways, your walkways, conference rooms, offices, eating areas, waiting areas, any area that may have been accessed by a COVID-19 case. Oh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm already tired of going through this. So let's talk about <laughs> hang in there, the, Curtis. These, yeah. Let's talk about the, the ten COVID laws, the ten COVID commandments from Cal OSHA. All right, so the first one requires a system for communicating. Basically, what you have to do here is create a system where employees can report exposures and hazards, hazards to management. You have to create a system where you can inform employees who are at increased risk of severe COVID-19 illness. So people who are 65 and older or have other underlying health conditions, you have to inform them of possible accommodations that can be provided. You have to inform employees about access to testing, access to uh, testing options and consequences if somebody tests, whether it's positive or negative. And you have to communicate information about your workplace hazards, possible workplace hazards. And what you have to do here is assign an employee to be your COVID czar. So imagine your, your workplace is the White House, you're gonna have a COVID czar. You're gonna have an employee assigned, maybe a team of employees if, if, if one isn't enough. A COVID czar that's going to be the point of contact for reporting, a point of contact for informing and educating employees, a point of contact for training and providing materials and informing the benefit, and a, a point of contact for uh, reporting uh, possible exposures and, and cases, and a person who's responsible for in, in investigating and routinely inspecting the workplace for COVID-19 hazards. So this uh, COVID czar is gonna be in, in charge of identifying and evaluating your COVID-19 hazards, specifically screening employees, when they come to the workplace. If you're gonna screen employees, making sure that the proper process is used for screening employees, meaning a, a non-contact thermometer is used. You ask the questions of have you had the symptoms? Have you been in contact with somebody who's tested positive or has symptoms? And making sure people wear, wear uh, proper uh, protective equipment during that interaction. Curtis, and what about like I said, go ahead, sorry. All right, Curtis. What about having um, making available a contactless thermometer, like at the front door, where people would self-check when they come in? Yeah, that is acceptable. Doing a self-check, uh, you just have to make sure that after somebody uses the non-contact thermometer, that there's some kind of disinfectant that the employee right. could use or visitor could use to wipe everything down. And you can have a, a, a checklist or a report that lists, um, you know what time the employee got and what time the employee checked themselves and so forth. And again, your, your, your COVID czar is going to be in charge of that. Uh, your COVID czar is also going to be responsible for conducting a workplace specific identification of all interaction areas. So all areas that employees may congregate or gather uh, for communicating or for working. And that could be the front office area, 
It could be a hallways, break room, eating areas, restrooms, so forth. And in doing so, your COVID czar is supposed to treat everyone as potentially infectious. This is also a new, a new kind of uh, requirement from the CDC that you treat everyone as potentially infectious. COVID czar is supposed to make sure that if you're an indoor working place, make sure that you maximize outdoor airflow. And if outdoor airflow is not possible, or if it's uh, this is very little outdoor airflow that you install or have some kind of air filtration system. The COVID czar is supposed to review applicable orders and guidance from the state local health department and to routinely evaluate prevention controls and periodically inspect to identify unhealthy conditions. So that's our that's our COVID czar. So in, in, in my office, uh, many of you may know Lorraine Harden O'Brien. She has been uh, assigned as our COVID czar. And if you know Lorraine from working with her or interactions, then you'll know that she's very meticulous, very precise. And I don't think my office has ever been more clean or more healthy or more sanitized than, uh, than ever. With uh, with Lorraine keeping on it, so that that's that's the first the first chunk of the process here. Have a have a COVID nineteen czar, have a system that's communicating, and have a system for investigating and identifying hazards and cases. All right, the regulation then goes on to talk about what happens if there is a COVID nineteen COVID nineteen case in the workplace. Basically, you have to establish a plan to respond to three contingencies. You get a report at work that somebody's walking around sick. You get a somebody who comes up to you and says, I'm sick. Or you get somebody who calls in and says, I have symptoms, I'm sick, I don't wanna come into work. So you have to identify the process and plan and put it all out in writing in the plan of what are you gonna do in, in these three contingencies. And once you get a report of a case or a possible case, then you have to do proper record keeping to find out when the exposure happened, when did the person get symptoms, if they took a test, when did they take the test, when did they get the test results. And if somebody is, is tested positive, then you have to give uh, notice within one business day to everyone that may have been exposed to that person who tested positive. And you must also provide testing to your employees at no cost to the employee. So if John Doe comes up to you and says, uh, Linda, I'm sick, and I've been around all these other employees, then all you must inform those other employees that they may have been exposed. You cannot identify the person who says they're sick, and then you must give everyone who you inform of the possible exposure you must pay for their own COVID tests. And you keep good records. And part of this process is if any COVID-19 hazards are identified while investigating COVID cases, you correct them. We've talked about training and instruction. We should all be familiar with physical distancing. One requirement here, is, which is already consi pretty consistent with the CDC, is that uh, if you're unable to maintain the six feet of social distancing at work, you have a physical barrier that's solid, that is cleanable. Use a physical barrier to separate employees that cannot maintain social distancing, that's solid and cleanable. Uh, we already know about face coverings, but the regulation emphasizes face coverings. Face coverings cannot uh, cannot be so loose knit that moisture or air can get through. They must be tight knit and must be worn at all times when you are within six feet of another employee or in. Uh, 
public areas. So there are times when you can take off the mask under the regulation when you're alone in the room. Like I have my own office to so take off my mask in my in my office. You take off your mask while you're eating and drinking. And you can take off your mask if you have a certified medical condition uh, that prevents you from wearing a mask. And, and this requirement, again, yeah, go ahead, Linda. I was going to say, you know, the California Department of Public Health came out with another rule, right, like a week ago or so, and they're pretty clear, and I've gotten a lot of calls about this as well. Um, you know, it was before, oh, if you're six feet away or something, like you're working in a cubicle or whatever, you don't have to have it. That's not the case anymore. I mean, they're very specific. You're, If you're out in the open, if you're walking to the office, if you're walking to and from the office, if you're uh, going into a restaurant, right? Um, if you're sitting outdoor at a restaurant uh, while you're not actively eating and drinking, was the phrase that they use, that you need to have your mask on. Uh, they even say if you go outside, um, you have to have a mask with you. If I take my dog outside now, I have a mask with me. It doesn't mean I have to put it on, but on the chance that I'm going to come within six feet of somebody outside my household, I need to have it available. So they've really clamped down on the wearing of masks. Um, and it's also part of these new regs that the employer is responsible for policing this. <laughs> so it says that employers yeah. have to actually make sure the masks um, you have to provide the mask, you have to make sure that it's worn over the nose, over the mouth, and that it's being worn at all times. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I've gotten a lot of calls from from clients saying that they don't like the mask rule, and you know, i got to be honest, I don't really like it either, but there are a lot of laws I don't like that I have to comply with anyway. <laughs> right. I don't like the speed limit, but I, you know, I still have to yeah. follow it. More I wish less. I could drive solo in the carpool lane. <laughs> right. I'm not paying that ticket again. All right. So, yeah, the, the face covering, it, it's, it's now a thou shalt. You have to do it. Employees must wear it and you must police it. Not only that, you're, you're also under the new regulations must have a notice at the front of your business, front desk, entrance, wherever, for guests, visitors, and vendors, suppliers, contractors that might come in, informing of your requirements that face masks be worn within your premises or with on your premises, and that uh, the, the guests, visitors, et cetera, so forth, must also wear the face masks. All right, the regulation goes on to talk about other con engineering controls and administrative control, personal protective equipment. We've pretty much touched on it already. Uh, this isn't really new. I don't want to spend any time on it. Uh, there are some new uh, if, or there are some new requirements for uh, record keeping. So this whole process we've, we've been talking about here with your COVID czar and investigating cases and exposures, uh, you must now keep physical written records of everything that happens in this whole COVID czar investigation reporting process. Keep records of all the training that you do. Keep records of all reports or complaints, reports of cases or complaints of hazards. Keep records of remediation efforts that are, that are taken. Uh, keep records of when somebody reports a case, when somebody reports that they got a test, when somebody reports that they got the results from the test. And it, it's actually, it, it is a burden, but it will actually be helpful because we're going to get to in the next little section here on exclusion of COVID-19 cases. There are different time periods that must be tracked when somebody is exposed and when gets a positive, and the, the record keeping will help you keep track of all of that. So it is an administrative burden, but I think it will be helpful. So the last topic I want to go, go over here for exclusion of COVID-19 cases. So this is different than what we've seen from the CDC and from Big OSHA so far. Obviously, we know if somebody tests positive, there are to be, uh, if they are self-quarantined at home until they're better. But now under the new Cal OSHA regulation, if somebody is merely exposed, then they must self-quarantine for 14 days. And if this is a new type of paid leave, the employer must continue all earnings and benefits throughout that self-quarantine. 
So this is in addition to what we've seen under FSCRA. Before, if somebody was exposed and they self-quarantined, they were just going on employment or working from home. Now, in California, if somebody is exposed at work and they self-quarantined, they must continue to be paid their uh, usual benefits. There is an exception here that if the employer can demonstrate that a person was, that an employee was exposed outside of work, then the obligation to continue those benefits does not exist and the employee is to seek other forms of benefits such as paid sick leave vacation and FSCRA rights. To be able to return to work, the, the CDC just yesterday changed the guidelines on this and they changed these guidelines in August and they changed them before that. It's a moving target. But as of yesterday, this is under the CDC, what the CDC says, and Cal OSHA originally adopted these this regulation based on what the CDC had said in August. So we're we're hoping that the Cal OSHA it changes its regulation based on what the CDC said just yesterday. But if you are exposed, but you, you do not develop symptoms, then you can actually return to work within 10 days instead of 14. And if you are exposed and get a negative test result you can actually return to work in seven days. So that is new. But that's not the law right now. That's in California. what the CDC, yeah. So that's what the CDC has said, and we're crossing our fingers, hoping that the, the Cal OSHA follows suit. Because the Cal OSHA has followed suit on the other timing periods, and we, we'll, we'll show this in the slide in a couple, couple minutes, moments here. So we're hoping that Cal OSHA follows suit on the CDC CDC's regular and uh, the CDC's guidelines that came out yesterday. But until that happens, if you test, if I'm sorry, if you're exposed at work, you are to self quarantine for 14 days, and the employer is supposed to pay for all 14 days. So Curtis, I think the next couple of slides actually you've already gone through all of these things. So because it's after 11:30, I'm going to just suggest we fast forward a little bit. Um, yeah, let's fast forward. Yeah, so these are like the, the things that we just went over here, like Curtis is just talking about 14 days. And again, even though he's mentioning the CDC has changed its guidance, hasn't been adopted yet by California. So we need to continue to play by um, the rules that are on this slide right here, right? So we tried to break it down into the three different categories for you, um, but this is the latest guidance for California, okay? so. If you've tested positive but you don't have symptoms, or if you have symptoms, or if you have exposure but there, you know, you haven't had a positive test or any symptoms, um, this will give you a little cheat sheet there on when you can return to work. Um, do you want to talk about outbreak a little bit, Curtis? Because that's sort of an important issue. Yeah, I don't want to spend too much time on an outbreak. Is when three or more COVID cases are reported out of workplace within a 14-day period. If there's an outbreak, then you must report it to Cal OSHA and your local health department, and you must go through additional procedures to sanitize and, and clean uh, your workplace. And you yeah, provide notice to all employees of the outbreak, not just the ones who may have been exposed. Yeah, and that's a big change, right? Because up until now, we've done the contact tracing. We've said, okay, who has been exposed? You still have to do that for the purpose of sending people home, but you're required now to provide notice to all employees who are working at the exposed workplace. And this is a 14-day look-back period for the most part, right? Um, and then again, you know, you're going to have to um, do testing multiple times at, at your cost as the employer. So this is a big change um, and one that everybody needs to make sure you have a plan in place for. So let's take a look at sort of a scenario. Oops, there's, let's start with the first scenario. So let's say you own a manufacturing company, right? And one of your employees comes back from Thanksgiving and then yesterday they come to you and they've been working all week, right? They come back to you and they say, hey, um, I just found out I was with somebody at Thanksgiving dinner and they've tested positive, right? So one of the big changes is there's no longer an exemption for critical infrastructure employers, right? So like I got a call from a client, this manufacturer earlier in the week and she said, hey, I've got this situation. Can I still have them work as long as he's wearing a mask? I said, yes. And then I had to call her back and go, nope, got to send him home, right? Because there's a new law in place. 
Um, so there's no exemption. So that means that all ex exposed, exposed employees need to stay home for 14 days and self-quarantine. Okay, now because that employee was presumably outside of work exposed, like, you know, in this case she knew, hey, I got, ex I got um, you know, the exposure from somebody I spent Thanksgiving with, then there's no requirement to pay her under this new law. She can apply for unemployment, she can use her PTO or whatever, um, things like that. She's not paid under the emergency paid sick leave under the FFCRA because, you know, she doesn't have symptoms, the doctor hasn't told her to stay home, you know, she isn't, she's not seeking a diagnosis for anything. So there's also no need to report it to your workers' comp carrier or any other agency until if and when this becomes a situation, right? There's also no need for anybody else at the company to quarantine because it's not an exposure to coworkers. I get this question a lot, right? So for her, you know, she had a direct exposure. Unless she develops symptoms or tests positive, there's no risk to the other people that she's working with, okay? But let's just say, um, as our follow-up scenario here, you know, the that employee, she comes in and she develops symptoms and tests positive today, right? She comes to you and she says, hey, I'm not feeling well. She goes and she gets tested positive and she's been at work all week. One of her coworkers, this one male, develops symptoms tomorrow, right? So now you've got a situation where you have to do contact tracing for both workers, right? Let's say three employees are identified as possibly being direct, direct exposed. Again, you're gonna notify everybody because the second one is now a workplace exposure. Those three employees must also self-quarantine, right? You have to provide them notification. They have to be paid their wages and benefits under this new law. They also have to be provided with free testing, okay? Um, because the male employee was at work, he may need to be paid under EPSL, right? He's going to have to be paid under the new Cal OSHA laws if it goes beyond that, um, and he has to have the free testing. And then there is a need to report the second one to your workers' comp carrier. And then you look at the three that were sent home, and you watch them to see if they also go on to develop symptoms or test positive, okay? So the rules have definitely changed, and it's important that you have clarity about exactly what has to be done um, for each of these different types of scenarios because they're all going to be a little different, right? You had a situation with, you know, one employee who was exposed outside of work. Now you have to treat the second one differently because he was exposed at work, as far as we know. So, Curtis, you want to talk about workers' comp? Yeah, so earlier in the year, uh, the, the California Health Department uh, issued a, a temporary rule that COVID cases were presumed uh, work illnesses. Well, the, uh, the legislature stepped in and codified that, made it an actual statute, an actual law, that if somebody is tested positive and they're, they've returned to work, as we can uh, figuratively say, it's presumed a workers' comp illness, and that means uh, that the employer must report the illness to the workers' comp carrier as a workers' comp workplace illness. There is a presumption here that the illness is a workers' comp illness that can be rebutted by demonstrating that the person got sick outside of work. So it's presumption of compensation. And what we've actually been seeing is uh, hospitals have been now battling with workers' comp carriers to get reimbursed for treatment costs, All right? So your, your health insurance company has been trying to get money from your workers' comp carrier because of this new presumption that workers' comp, uh, that the illness is a workers' comp illness. And so what we're gonna see from this with, with uh, workers' comp carriers, doling out tons of cash is that everyone's premiums are going to go up for workers' comp coverage across the board. Well, let's hope that's not the case, but that could be. Um, you can also see on here that the outbreak definition um, has, you know, is a little bit different as well. So you want to make sure that uh, the outbreak definition is used differently um, right, for reporting versus what Cal OSHA is using it for. So just make sure that you have some clarity on that as well. And uh, oh, one more thing about 
the emergency paid sick leave. So FFCRO only applies to employers of 500 or, or fewer employees, basically small businesses. Well, California likes to replicate what the federal government does. And so California went ahead and made emergency paid sick leave available to large employers as well, employers of 500 or more employees. And that's nationwide, so you, it's a cumulative count. And this is for, again, people, individuals who are subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine isolation order or who are advised by a health care provider to self-quarantine or prohibited from working due to health concerns. It's very much FFCRA, but for large employers. And so that's California specific. So if you thought you're off the hook because you had fewer than, or if you had more than 500 employers, you are no longer off the hook. And a note on FFCRA, it's set to expire December 31st, but we anticipate that Congress will extend those benefits. I saw that uh, Congress has started negotiating again for another relief bill, and so we expect that FFCRA will be expanded in that relief bill. Yeah, I can't believe that it would not be, right? Yeah. Okay, I know that the chat has been blowing up with questions. Um, we're gonna blow through this next section. It's doubtful we're gonna get done right at noon, so hopefully everybody can stick around, but if you can't, um, we are recording it and we'll be able to get you a link afterwards in case you do have to jump off. Um, we didn't do a very good job estimating how long this was gonna take, clearly, um, but we're gonna move forward with some non-COVID laws, because yes, there is more going on in California uh, than just that, and we're gonna try to go through quickly, because I don't think this is probably the stuff that's gonna be on most people's minds with just a couple of exceptions. Exceptions. So everybody remember that AB5 was passed um, and went into effect this past year where all, you know, basically all employees in California are presumed to be, um, or all workers are presumed to be employees. And then you have this ABC test, right? And the B portion of this is the one that gave everybody headaches, that the worker performs work that's outside the usual course of the hiring entity's business. And unless all three criteria are meet, the workers were deemed to be employees. So there was one little glimmer of hope, AB 2257 did expand some of the exceptions, right? So you can see people, um, these people at the bottom here that are typically freelancers, right? So a lot of people, and I've done the same thing, hire, you know, a graphic designer, hire an illustrator, hire a somebody, right, to do something for you because that's not what you normally do. Um, so there is some exceptions, okay? But again, don't get too excited because one, this is straight off of EDD's website, right? This isn't Photoshopped, it is a screen capture that I did, right? So it says that workers will be considered employees unless proven otherwise. And I've been through too many EDD audits with clients to know that they're not playing around on this, right? They are gonna look really quickly to see are you paying people under a social security number, for example, or are you going to pay people under an EIN? And if you're not paying them under an EIN, that's the first thing that they look for, and then they go from there, right? So even if you have that freelancer situation, it doesn't mean that they're exempt um, from the law. It just means that now you have to impose the old Borello test that's been around for a long time, also called the right to control test, it weighs 11 different factors, and essentially they're looking to see who's controlling the work of the, of the employee or the worker, right? Can they affect their own profit and loss? This is one of the reasons why I've always argued with Marla, you know, that I don't, don't believe that uh, Uber drivers, for example, are independent contractors. They don't set any of the rates, right? It's controlled by somebody else. So you can go down this list. It's like, you know, the level of expertise comes into play, whether they are offering the service to other, you know, um, clients, right? Who's providing the equipment, tools, and stuff like this. So just take a look at this, and at the end of the day, I'm gonna tell you, Curtis and I are on the same page here, you know, be really, really reluctant to use independent contractors in the state of California right now. It is, they are clear that they don't want you to, and they're making it as difficult as possible. So just tread really carefully. If the person providing the service has their own business, like if you engage Ethos, obviously you're paying us under an EIN, you're not paying it under my social security number, there is a difference, right? If it's a company providing the service versus an individual. Yeah, you can hear the this rule is, a big... it's a, sorry, look at just real quick. The rule is yeah. a worker is presumed an employee. That means 
you can't call me and say, hey, can I hire this person as an independent contractor? So the, the law is a worker's presumed employee, and then you, if you want to then classify them as an independent contractor, you have to pass the ABC test or pass Borello. And uh, just as a note, uh, Prop 22 did pass, and the at-base drivers, at drivers are now independent contractors by statute. So a Borello, right. Borello will not apply to them. Right. Exactly. Great. Okay, this is going to be a huge change for small employers. So up until now, the Family Medical Leave Act and the California Family Rights Act applied only if you had 50 or more employees in a 75-mile radius. California took the California Family Rights Act and effective January, that is going to drop down to five, yes, I'm not kidding you, five or more employees, right? So it's going to require you small business owners, right, to offer an unpaid but job protected leave for 12 weeks in a 12 month period, right? So if somebody comes to you and, you know, I mean, we already have protection for pregnancy, but if somebody comes to you with another medical condition or they need to take care of a family member or whatever, you're going to have to keep their job for them and allow them to go out on this leave for 12 weeks. It also expanded the definition of family, the definition of child, Right, and it also now grants independent rights to both parents. So if you have a child, for example, that's ill, and it used to be you employed both the, the mom and the dad, let's say, or two moms or two dads or whatever, but both parents that combined, you could restrict them to 12 weeks. Now each one can take 12 weeks off to care for that child. Um, and then it also has some additional uh, leave that got expanded uh, military leave expanded for different family members as well. Um, there's a new pay data reporting requirement if you have 100 or more employees. So again, a step up in terms of how large the company is. You're going to have to each year report pay data now to the Department of Fair Employment and Housing before, on or before March 31st and then every year after that. And it, essentially what they're looking for is equal pay violations, right? So they're going to do a quick analysis. They're going to say, wait a second, why are all the men paid more than the women or all the whites paid more than the blacks or whatever it is, right? They're going to do that analysis now. Um, they have published FAQs on their website. So this is the link right here and you can go and take a look um, and get more information on that. But if you have 100 or more employees, um, and it does include part-time employees, you're going to need to go and make sure that you're compliant with this in the first quarter of next year. Each year, minimum wage goes up. Um, so I've put the new rates in here. For 25 or fewer employees, it's going to be $13 an hour. And for 26 or more, it's going to be $14 an hour. So you want to make sure that by January 1st, you've raised all employees' wages to at least the minimum right? Always, always, always remember to check local ordinances and county rules to see if they have a higher minimum wage. So if you're in San Francisco, for example, you know, you're already at $15 an hour as you might be in other areas too. Even Los Angeles County is higher than this. So always take a look at that and then just figure out what to do about wage compression issues, meaning how do you handle the people that right now that have been there for a couple years that are at $14 an hour and now you're going to take your you know, entry level people to 14, and how are you going to handle that? Also remember that with minimum wage increasing, minimum exempt salaries goes up as well. So it goes up to twice the state minimum wage, okay? So you don't have to worry, like if you're in San Francisco, you don't have to, you know, um, use like $15 an hour, for example, as the basis for this calculation, but you're going to take twice the minimum wage, and I put the information here, and you need to make sure that all exempt employees are paid at least that minimum. When we go in to do an audit, that's one of the things we ask for is we say, hey, print me on a list of all of your employees, give us this information and tell us you know, how they're classified. So it's an easy scan to go down the list and say, oh, this person is salary, but they're making 40,000 a year, right? Well, that's a violation. I don't even have to talk even further about duties, right? So there's the requirement, the duties requirement for each exemption, and then there's also the minimum salary. So at least get the salary, right? Because that's an easy one to fix or to be caught about. And then, you know, if you ever have questions about the duties portion of that, then you can reach out to me or Curtis and we can help you with that. Just also, I didn't put it in the slides, but there are minimum salaries for computer professionals and doctors and other little categories like this. Um, the minimum salary for computer professionals, just so you know, is about $99,000 next year. So for those of you that have 
you know, people in your office working in your IT department um, and you have them on salary, you want to make sure that you have them at that higher uh, rate as well. Okay, paid family leave. Um, you know, this provides, you know, wage replacement. There's just, um, it, there's an expanded definition having to do with a qualifying exigency. Uh, so if somebody gets called up for active duty, someone wants to take time off, it just it also expanded the definition of family member to sort of mirror what the CFRA has. So now it includes grandparents, grandchildren, and siblings where it didn't before. And Curtis, I'm going to turn it back to you and ask you to talk fast. Yeah, so before we had a new law that says no rehire provisions in settlement or release agreements, we the, the ones that I drafted and, and Marlon's been drafting for years never had this, so this is never a concern for us. But many employers do like to contain new no rehire provisions. So the law says uh, you cannot include a no rehire clause. Um, in Which your is settlement too bad. Agreement. <laughs> Which is too bad, right? You've just settled with this person to try to get rid of them, and now it's like you can't tell them, you know, that you can't come back to work here. Extend the statute of limitations for a certain labor code complaints, uh, six months to a year for discrimination, for certain discrimination and harassment complaints. Uh, just, just know that if, if anything ever happens, just give us a call, we can walk you through the process. Statements of information. So, for uh, in the, the statement of information for LLCs and corporations now must uh, have a statement of whether a manager or an officer has a uh, an outstanding final judgment against them for a labor code violation. To, to me, is is crazy. So, Prop 24 on CCPA passed. It expands CCPA. Uh, it just makes it more strict, more harder to comply with. A note on CCPA is it applies to a lot more businesses than people realize. Uh, one of the uh, required or, or one of the eligibility criteria is that uh, a, a company collects 50,000 or more data points within a year. And the a data point is described extremely broadly. And it's something along the lines that there's 100 data points per individual, per human being. So if you're talking to 500 or more people in, within a year, you are going to be subject to CCPA and you need to call us to get compliance. Uh, fortunately, CCPA compliance for employers was, uh, pro was prolonged, was postponed due to COVID, which is a bit of a relief. Definition for kin care was expanded. It used to be you could use 50% of your available leave, basic leave for kin care. Now you can employ employee can designate their their sick leave solely. Um, we thought this was already the law, so we really don't see what the change is here. But technically, this is a new law. An employee can designate 100% of their leave for kin care if they if they, if they choose. I think I've said this to Curtis like five times over the last couple of weeks since we were preparing for this. I don't understand why this law still exists, Curtis, because under the paid yeah. sick leave law, can't they designate 100% of their sick pay how they want? <laughs> so not really yeah, sure why this it, law exists, but. Yeah, the legislature gets bored and yeah. they need to prove they're doing something. Expansion of crime victims leave. This is very nuanced and detailed, and to understand it, you really have to understand the changes you really need an understanding an in-depth understanding of the, of the law in the first place so my recommendation is if it happens if you have an employee who's a victim of a crime victim of sexual assault domestic assault harassment or stalking give us a call we can walk you through the process let you know what the rights are and what you have to do yeah, and you definitely are going to want to update your handbooks as well if you have this listed in there. So again, there's different rules depending on how um, large an employer you are, so take a look at that. Um, this was a Supreme Court case, Bostock versus Clayton County, Georgia. Um, so this was back in June. Most of us heard about it. It's not a big deal to California employers, um, but this does extend, you know, or prohibit discrimination, extend protection to the LGBTQ community across the nation. Um, we already had it in California, but we're letting the rest of the states catch up with us on this one. Um, and just also, just a quick note in case anybody uh, 
actually employs minors. Uh, they made it easier now. You don't have to actually go physically into a school to get the sign off to get a work permit. That was the AB 908 bill. The other bill is specific to the entertainment industry and has to do with the requirement to actually um, go through a harassment prevention training. And now the parent has to be there and certify with the labor commissioner and stuff in order for the minor to get a work permit in that industry. So just want to throw those in in case you work in that industry or have minors. Okay, harassment prevention training. We're going to wrap up with this and then we're going to take some questions. Um, harassment prevention training um, is a requirement for everybody to complete by the end of this year. Um, we're, we're having this bubble up frantically, right, because it hasn't been extended. It, got, it was supposed to be last year, now it's this year. What you also want to remember is that you need to have a system in place for making sure that all newly hired and newly promoted people are trained within six months, right? You want to ensure training is conducted by a qualified trainer. You can't just have anybody do it. Um, and you also have to include certain uh, certain concepts and certain you know, uh, information has to be included in there. You have to maintain the training records. And then there's a special requirement going forward for temporary agencies as well after the first of the year. We do provide this training. We do it all of the time. We've done it for a lot um, of people on this call because Marla's office always refers everybody to us and then we have our own clients we do it. We can do it on site. Most people don't want us coming on site right now. We can do it online via public webinar or a captive webinar for your own company. And we also have an on-demand um, option that a lot of people are taking advantage of right now and it's really good for getting caught up on the one-off people as you hire them as well so we have created our own content and we just give you a link basically and, and you can go out and the employee can do it on any sort of device uh, we also offer it in both English and Spanish we can help you write your policy that's required we have a confidential hotline for reporting and also we can do some proactive surveys to actually prevent or investigate issues before they get out of hand. Just a note because I don't normally um, share a lot of information on the webinars but a lot of questions have been coming up on this at the end of the year so call us if you need help writing or updating your handbook um, or if like you have not had to comply with CFRA and now you're wondering like how am I going to manage this leave, what forms do I need, how do I do this and you want help with that. Um, if you have any concerns at all that you've misclassified your employees as exempt or independent contractors, you want to make sure you reach out to me or Curtis to get help with that. And if you don't have the time or expertise to write that COVID plan that now is pretty extensive, then please make sure that you reach out to us as well. Um, and we, of course, always appreciate referrals to any small business owner who doesn't have a professional HR resource and wants one. All right, so we are just about at the noon hour again. Curtis, I hope you can stick around for a little bit. Um, I'm I here. I know I can. For people who are going to have to jump off, I'll just make a couple of notes again. If you if uh, you were late joining us, I mentioned that if you need HRCI credit or you want recertification credits on SHRM, just drop you know HRCI or SHRM into the um, chat box and we'll collect that and send you a certificate of um, attendance uh, after this. Also if you have any um, ideas about future webinar uh, topics that you want uh, please let us know. You can email me or you can drop them into the chat as well. We'd love to get some ideas on what it is that you would like to see. Uh, we don't have one scheduled yet for January. We're thinking about doing it on how to how to manage a remote workforce um, and share that because it looks like this is not going away anytime soon. But we'll get back to you once we have a date and time in mind. Denise, I'm turning it back over to you. Okay, okay great. You Thanks. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of questions and I'm going to preface this by saying we have a lot of questions. We won't get them to them all and some of them are very specific. So what we'll do is make sure that you both see a copy of the questions and we can follow up with them at a later date. Um, a couple of questions. Um, we talked about uh, COVID czar. It's, does the COVID czar have to be someone that is added to the staff or someone that can be appointed? No, that can be someone who's appointed. Someone who's already on your staff. So if you already have a, a human resource employee or a controller that kind of does both duties, you can just add yes. duties to that person that, that already exists. You don't need to hire somebody new. Yeah, safety, doesn't matter. We have clients, I mean, I have a CPA firm, the receptionist is doing it. It's just to have a focal point and somebody that's really dedicating, dedicated to watching over this. 
Okay. Um, how much time has to pass after a possible exposure before we start testing employees? If they were you know, exposed that's, to an employee. Tough, yeah, that's a tough one. So the, the, the guidance from Kalosha is that you can send them to get tested immediately. But the problem with that is the CDC has said that a person is probably not going to be able to test positive until 24 to 48 hours afterwards, just because there is an incubation period. Um, which I think that's why the, the CDC yesterday changed some of their, their guidance. Uh, so if you, if you, you can send somebody to test, you can send them to get tested right away, but still have them quarantined for seven days if they test negative, because they could test negative and still develop symptoms if you have them go and test too early. So there really isn't a, a time period for, for employees who are exposed. If somebody is exposed, since you're under an obligation to exclude them, I would go ahead and send them to get tested right away and then have them self-isolate or work from home. Okay. There's a lot of questions on testing and stuff, so we're, we're going to hit a couple. Um, can we have our employees use their health insurance to pay for the testing as long as we reimburse them for any co-pays? That is a big fat no. <laughs> well, there you go. That sounded like a hard stop. To, yeah, I was <laughs> well, say, that's all I've got. <laughs> okay. Because um, even uh, even if you have them, yeah, but just follow. So even if you have them use their health insurance to pay for it, their health insurance is just going to seek reimbursement from your workers' comp carrier, and that's going to increase your rate. So it uh, either you pay for it directly, or it comes out of your your future increased premiums, it's going to come back to you somehow. So uh, my recommendation is just, be pay, just pay for the test right away, not have them use their insurance. And Curtis, I don't remember if we mentioned this or not, but another change or maybe clarification in the rules is that employers cannot require employees to produce a negative test before returning to work. Yeah, that is correct. So the the, the regime now for returning for work is symptom-based. Before it was uh, a negative test-based, and that, that wasn't too reliable because somebody could be healthy, could recover, could no longer be contagious, but still have the virus in their body and still test positive, even weeks after they're no longer sick. So the regime for returning back to work is a symptom-based test. Right. Yeah, we have um, one of our one of our clients actually runs urgent care clinics, and so this the CDC basically abandoned their testing strategy to return people back to work back in July. And I was talking to Julie, our client, and she said, you know, they're having people that no longer um, have any sort of symptoms at all, but they continue to test positive. She had one that went for like 59 days that was continuing to test yeah. positive, but there was no evidence of any sort of symptoms or viral shredding, um, shedding. And so she said, um, you know, they were seeing just a lot of issues with the test. So yeah, use the symptom strategy. We'll wait and see if Cal OSHA adopts the new strategy that CDC has put out, um, and we'll see what happens. Um, the other thing, just so everybody should know, is I think Governor Newsom's probably in the process of having his um, daily briefing. I got a text uh, from Ivana on our team while we were on the thing, and she said uh, she's she's been told by people that she's expecting him to announce a full shutdown again for California. So we'll see what happens. So stay tuned on that as well. Great. Yeah. Just getting better every day. Um, okay. Uh, if now that we have this new notification that we have to notify our employees within uh, one business day, um, is the notification for only those who did not have the 15 minute cumulative exposure within six feet, but were working in the same exposed workspace. So we have a couple different questions. So people need to understand what if they were in a different building? What if you know they weren't in the same area? So that's come up a couple different times. Yeah, and I've had that, that question before. It's a good question. So the, the notice for exposure is only for for notice for one employee has been exposed is only for the employees, vendors, visitors, guests who are actually exposed to that employee who is sick. So that's somebody who was within six feet for 15, a cumulative 15 minutes within a 24 day, a 24 hour day. So 
if you have one building that where, so you have an office where somebody's sick, but then your manufacturing warehouse somewhere else was never visited by that office employee who was sick, you don't need to tell the, the manufacturing warehouse. You don't need to provide them notice. Okay. But also, um, one, have... one other thing on that, though, remember also, you have a requirement for each like site location to have its own COVID plan, right? So you're not going to be able to get away with like, oh, well, all of these buildings are under one COVID plan, and then turn around and say, oh, but we didn't notify people you know, in this other building. You're going to have to be really, really careful about it. Um, if everything's going to be the same, then slap a different you know, cover sheet on the COVID plan, and that's fine. But just be careful you're not being disingenuous about it and creating a different problem for yourself. Okay, um, we have a couple of questions that we're asking for samples of record keeping forms. I know that uh, anyone listening to here can reach out to either Curtis or Linda to have a specific policy written so that you would have uh, copies of the forms. Um, well, and another let question me about jump in on that one, Denise. Let me jump in on that yeah. one. So I heard mm -hmm. what Curtis said, and that's fine. And I always defer to attorneys, but I'm going to just I'm going to tell you I have a different opinion on the record keeping portion. So. He said mm -hmm. this in response to my question about could you have a con contactless thermometer like at the door. I'm going to tell you don't keep any records and here's why. I've had too many litigators tell me um, the problem if you start down that path of having a record like we early on we said okay when people show up to work you know have them write something that says or certify something that says they you know don't have any symptoms and they don't have a fever or something like that or if you're taking their temperature you know make a record of it and they said there's no good that's going to come of that just have a consistent practice and just say this is what we do because anybody representing a plaintiff is going to say oh look what happened on you know december 3rd there's nothing on this page, right? But this visitor showed up and you're going to have discrepancies. And so their advice was like, don't keep those type of records. Now, Curtis, my question to you is, is there a requirement under the new law that requires you to keep those records? <laughs> yes, there is. So I, I appreciate what you're so saying, Linda, and I, you know, I, I, I agree generally with the practice because if you, like I said, if there's a hole, then that's just asking for problems but under the under the new regulation it is a must it's one of the, the ten public commandments you have to keep records written records of everything that you do whether it's screening or investigating you have to keep a record of everything but is a record the policy statement that this is what our practice is or is the record that hey um, somebody used a thermometer so they have to record it because if it's the latter then what about people what about companies whose plan says we have employees self check at home well so it's it's whatever you choose to do you have to be consistent with so you don't necessarily need to keep a record of everyone's uh, self check every day but if you are going to have records, then you, you must keep them and be consistent, if that makes sense. A so you bit. don't have to have a checklist. Up. You don't have to have a, a list at the front door of everyone signing in. But if you are going to do it, then you must keep that record. Right. And that's why I'm in favor of don't keep the record to begin with, right? Have the policy that says this is what we do. And then you know, everybody's sort of on their honor system, they check their temperature, and if it's, you know, below 100.4, then there you go. Yeah, so that, so that, that is acceptable for screening, but for investigations and re remediations and in, uh, inspecting, there, there must be written records for all of those activities. Got it. Okay, thanks. Well, I, I didn't know about the COVID-10 commandments, thank you. Um, with the new mask rules, if employees are sitting in cubicles in an open bay, but the cubicle walls are six feet high and the cubicles are large enough to meet that six foot requirement between two people, are they still required to wear a mask at all times? Well, to be able to answer that question, I would need more information. Is the, 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 it's not just that there is a barrier. It has to be a proper barrier. So one, the barrier has to be solid. I know a lot of cu cubicle walls are just kind of like a nylon covering on both sides that aren't necessarily solid. The, the, the barrier must also be cleanable, meaning it can be disinfected. And I don't, you know, I've seen a lot of cubicle barriers that have, you know, have that nylon mesh and I don't know how cleanable they are. 
I suspect not very cleanable. So uh, if it's a, a cubicle barrier that is solid, is cleanable, and uh, can prevent the, the transmission, then uh, six feet high, whether you can chime in too, uh, from what I understand, six feet high is okay, but um, I, it's, it's not just six feet high. Yeah. It, it's got to be solid and cleanable. Okay. Yeah, and I don't, I mean, you're taking this out of the Cal OSHA regs, right, Curtis, what yes. you're talking about? Because when, when I looked at the California Department of Public Health regs, I don't see an exception for cubicles. If they're open, if they don't have a door where you can close it, I don't. I think you have a requirement to wear a mask now. I think anytime you're in an open open work environment, I think those regs are pretty clear. But you can go to the California Department of Public Health you know, website and just search face mask and the, you know, the list is there. Um, I don't want to pull it up right now while we're on this, but, um, you know, I think it's pretty clear. So it said, again, there was like five or six different exceptions. One, if you're actively eating or drinking, um, and the other one was if you were in an office by yourself, um, then you could take off your mask. But I did not see an exception for cubicles. Yeah, the, the the engineering controls for social distancing just say a, a partition. They, it, the Cal, the the OSHA regulations here don't talk about height or size. Um, so it, in that case, it's probably just going to differ case by case. But we're also going to have to play to the highest, most stringent standard, right? Going back to the very first comment I made. So if the California Department of Public Health says you have to wear a mask at all times, right, except with these exceptions, it's going yeah, to I be a don't... higher standard. I just don't know if that's necessarily the case because it's not necessarily an, an open area. There are petitions. I just don't think that the state has really has really taken this on. I don't think there is an answer for it. Probably goes back to Linda's comments. If you can make your employees stay at home, stay at home. Yeah, exactly. Um, Solve everybody's yeah, problem. You, yeah. yeah, you've been preaching that since it started. Okay, um, if you have an outbreak, of COVID cases, three plus in a 14-day period, as that's the new definition, does the employer have to mandate all employees get tested or only offer the test and the employees can choose to get tested or not? So that's, can an employee, unless in fact refuse to get tested, I guess. Yeah. When did you know I that one up? Pop from my head, I'd have to look it up. Yeah, I that's a really good question. I believe that it said the employer will test all employees was like the words or the phrase it was used. Um Okay, so I, yeah, I looked it up here. It's it's only the ones who are exposed. It says all employees exposed during the the 14-day period. So it's not necessarily all employees. It's only the ones who are exposed. And if an employee doesn't have any symptoms, they can decline testing, even if they were exposed, just as a follow-up. Uh, yeah, sure. An employee can decline testing. They still have their 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 California Constitution rights to privacy. You know, let's okay. let's um, Denise, what, will you just make a note of this and let's double check this because I thought last night when I was reading it said under an outbreak de again defend. De depending on the definition of outbreak, all employees at that location had to be tested. So let's just, we'll circle back with everybody on a follow-up email on that one and get some clarity before we um, confuse people. Okay, um, we're at 12.14. Do you wanna take one more question and wrap Keep up? Because going. we still have a ton, okay? We um, still have a lot of people see. on uh, the call too, so clearly this is important stuff. Yeah, so. I, I know, I was just looking at that too. Okay, um, an employee may have, uh, the, an employee may have been exposed that uh, he's part-time employee. How do we pay for him? An employee that may be exposed to COVID, but he's part-time. Yeah, well, it, it, it's after their, their usual earning. So if they work on average 20 hours a week, then you would just pay them for that, that average, that same consistent average 20 hours a week. Yeah. Like when we talk about the 80 hours under FFCR, it's really, it's, that's because most people work 40 hours in a week, right? So it's, or for most, most industries, um, but it's really, it's like what's gonna, 
you know, over that two-week period. So you just go back and just do a look back and take an average. Okay, a question again about um, offices. Um, so you talked about the offices and the six feet away mask and everything. Uh, someone was asking the question earlier in the uh, presentation, how does it work in an office if the landlord refuses to make any changes to protect the offices and the employees in the building? So I guess they haven't put in partitions or anything. That's a question for a lawyer. Yeah, so if it were me, uh, I would either make a complaint to the, I would just make a complaint to Cal OSHA. I'm trying to think if there's, if there's another agency I would make a complaint to, because if the, uh, if the landlord is not complying, then you need to get the government involved to force the landlord to comply. Okay. And you could probably complain um, to your your local county or city health department too, and they can come in and, and they can force the the building to comply. And worst case scenario, you can always file a lawsuit. Yeah, and they can call you. Yeah. Um, okay, just saying. Uh, okay, we have another question. If employees are still working from home, so they're not coming into the office, does the employer have to pay for COVID tests if they're exposed? No. I mean, the law on this mm -hmm. one is, is pretty clear. It's like if they have been working from home, then that is sort of by definition not in a, not a work-related exposure. Yeah, it's not a, a work site. So you don't have to pay for it. Okay, so then we have another question about somebody who had a technician go out to a client and the client had COVID. So what are the steps that the um, business owner now has to do with the technician that was exposed? Uh, quarantine. Send them yeah. to get tested and have a quarantine. Okay. Um, let's see. Another question. Do employers pay for testing for all potential COVID testing or only during an outbreak? It's for all exposed employees. Okay. Um, it's not just, I know it's that not just an outbreak where there's three or ten. Even if there's just one employee that shows up to work sick and they expose others, uh, you, you have to pay for it. And it's only for those who've been exposed. Okay. So that's really important to know where your employees have been and who they've been in contact with. Right. Yeah. We, okay. we recommend doing written contract tracing contact tracing uh so you can have each employee you can create a little form little spreadsheet and have employee, have the employee just keep a list of all of their in-person interactions that they have throughout the day it, it, again it's burdensome but it's, it's probably going to be beneficial in the end what if you work in a retail environment or a restaurant or something like that where you have to interact with guests well, the uh, workers are going to have masks on, for starters. Yeah. You know, so hopefully that helps cut it down. Okay. Um, can employees be paid while quarantining, use, quarantining sorry, using their PTO and go negative into their accrual account? That's a company decision. I mean, just, I, I always tell employers, I'm not a big fan of advancing vacation. It happens on occasion, but just know that you cannot like just deduct that from future paychecks unless the employee agrees. And if the employee leaves the company, your remedy is small claims court, basically, if they're unwilling to repay it to you. So just know that you're essentially making a loan that you may not collect on. But yeah, of course, you can do whatever you'd like. So what, one interesting point to, to make here is the Cal OSHA reg says that when an employee is self-quarantining, they are the, the company can use paid sick leave benefits to pay the employee, which I'm not sure how enforceable that is because the California, as we just mentioned in our webinar, the, the California statute, which is higher priority uh, and supersedes the regulation, says that the employees get to designate their paid sick leave, not the employer. So we really don't know how that's going to play out. Um, 
I would only use paid sick leave in, in covering somebody who's quarantining. I'm not sure if I would want to use, use vacation benefits. But, but let's change the facts slightly, Curtis, because what if um, you, know, you have an employee that has an exposure that's not work-related and they have to go home for 14 days? They can apply for unemployment, in theory, right? But yes. they could also say, hey, I want to use my PTO. Because I'm yeah, not so in that case, <laughs> I, I, and I, I totally get the, why somebody could be confused here. In that case, FFCRA benefits would apply. And under FFCRA, you can require the use of vacation. So if it's a non-workplace exposure and somebody has to self-quarantine, you can require use of vacation. Okay, now I think I'm confused. Under my yeah, facts, if it's a workplace exposure, if it's a workplace right. exposure, I would not use vacation. And that's just my, right. my that's just that's just Curtis speaking, based on the ambiguities and the the conflicts in the law and the regulation, that, right. that's, just my, that's what I would do to be safe. Okay, here's what confused me, is if an employee gets sent home to quarantine because of a non-work-related exposure, FFCRA is not gonna apply, right? It doesn't trigger it, one of the six reasons. It, it can if, it, if they're ordered by their, their healthcare provider to self-quarantine. Yes. Right, but if the employer makes a decision, or because this is the general rule now, right? If you have an exposure, you have to go home for 14 days. If it's not work-related, they go home for 14 days, there's nothing that triggers the employer's obligation to pay them. Correct, if it's not work-related, it's not FSCRA, then there's no obligation to pay. And right. the, the employee can choose to use vacation or sick leave. Right. Okay, you just answered another question, so that was great. <laughs> um, I, somebody else has had a question too. If the if the uh, if your employee went out of the country when they were when they came back in, would they be would they be required to have FFCRA? So you answered that question. That's great. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> well, okay. and while we're on that topic, so, Denise, this comes up a lot yeah. right now, um, especially with Thanksgiving. I had a lot of of clients call and say, "Hey." Um, you know, we don't want our employees to travel. You know, can I tell them no? And I was like, I wouldn't tell them no. It's on their own time. You know, it's not interfering with their work. What you can do though is have a policy that says, hey, if you are going to travel out of state or travel by mass transit or attend a gathering of more than 10 people or any other high risk activity, right, that you you will be required to self quarantine for 14 days before you're allowed to come back into the workplace. And we're not going to pay you. So good luck with that. Right, you could have a policy that says that. Yeah, so anytime an employee is at the direction and control of the employer, even if it's off working time or off schedule hours, they have to be compensated. So if you're going to have a policy of you cannot travel, then you have to pay your employees for 24 hours a day. So I would mm -hmm. absolutely not have that policy. But like Linda said, you can have a policy where we're not going to let you come to work if you travel. Okay. Um, we had a question about essential workers. The CDC said that they can continue to work if they are symptom-free. Does that apply under Cal OSHA also? No, that's what I was saying earlier. A, a lot of my clients are in the essential critical infrastructure sector, or whatever it's called, right? Essential businesses. And so if there was an exposure but no symptoms or positive tests, they were allowed to continue to work, just wear a mask. Now, under the new regs, that came out from Cal OSHA, there's no exception. So they want to clamp down, essentially look at it this way, they want all exposures to cease, right? So they're going to do everything mm -hmm. possible to clamp down on this, and so they're not making exceptions. They're like, if you've been exposed, you're going to go home for 14 days. Okay. Um, another question about testing. If an employee takes a test, so I'm assuming the employee in this in this specific incident, they don't mention it, but if an employee takes a test and their family does too, do we need to pay for the whole family's test or just the employee? So I'm assuming from this question that they were exposed at work and they were required to take a test so that the employee took a test. Is it required to have the, for the employer to pay for the family's test also? Uh, no, I've not seen any kind of obligation or requirement that extends to the family. Me either. OK. 
Okay. Um, um, as we are discussing medical testing, how do we protect ourselves from privacy complaints during, or if, I guess, if this person is assigned to be the, the czar, the COVID czar at the company? Well, that's a broad question. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a broad question. I, I mean, I will say this. Here are the mistakes I see employers making. And again, we will research the requirements you know, on some of the questions that have come back and get some clarity for you. But that's another reason I'm not really in favor of having some sort of log at the front door where people sign it and attest to, I have symptoms, I don't have symptoms, because I think that this, there's some personal health information issues there. Um, but here's where mm -hmm. I see people make a mistake. Like I got a call from somebody um, like last week that said, hey, I was, you know, I was exposed to somebody in the office, her boyfriend tested positive, and I went to, um, you know, I went to see the, you know, COVID czar and he sort of sh shared with me, oh, that's what I did when this other guy tested positive. And it's like, no, don't do that, right? It's like, don't mm -hmm. talk about other people in the office who have tested positive or have symptoms, right? Like when you do the notices for, for the possible exposures, you do not state, oh yeah, Jimmy over here, you know, tested positive or has symptoms. They will figure it out because Jimmy's now home for 14 days, right? And mm -hmm. if Jimmy tells people that's fine, but you shouldn't be telling people. Now in a small office, it's really noticeable when someone's not there. It's fine for you to go to Jimmy and say, hey, Jimmy, we're getting questions. Are you okay if we tell people you know, that um, you tested positive? Just get it in writing from Jimmy. I don't care if it's a text message, email, whatever, right? If Jimmy says it's okay to share, I think you're fine. But don't go around sharing people's public health you know, personal health information with coworkers, it will get you in trouble and it is definitely a violation. Okay, um, another question. If an employee contracts COVID-19, has a positive test, but he has not come into the work location or interacted with any customers or employees because they've been working remotely, does this still need to report it to workers' comp? To your workers' comp uh, area? Yeah. I would probably still report it, but let your, your carrier know that uh, there, there's a good chance that your carrier can rebut the presumption that it's a, a work-related illness. Yeah, I gave the same advice to somebody last week. I said, I would contact your, contact your workers' comp carrier, let them know that one of your employees is, has tested positive, but has not been working in the office. They've been working remotely. And I'm going to assume by working remotely, you're saying work from home, right? Because there's a big mm -hmm. difference between working like out in the field, like the technician question yeah. versus working from home. Um, when Governor Newsom announced the rebuttable presumption sort of category earlier this year, um, it did not apply to anybody working from home but that doesn't necessarily alleviate the responsibility of you reporting a positive case to your workers' comp care. Because the reason that they're doing that isn't to open a claim because you just have to, you have to report a positive test, right? That person may never get sick. So it's not to open a claim or pay benefits, it's that's how they're doing the contact tracing, right? So they know where the positive tests are because then the workers' comp care has a responsibility to report it to the state, right? So they're just, they're making it easy on employers in my opinion, they're, this is what they're trying to do, is they say, oh, you know who your workers' comp carrier is, call them up and tell them, as opposed to stay on the stay on the line with the California Department of Public Health, right, or the Orange County mm -hmm. Department of Public Health to report it directly to them. So I think that's why it's going on. So it has to still be reported, I believe, um, but you just tell your carriers, like this person's been working from home, it's not a workplace exposure, and then, and then they don't have symptoms or whatever the case is. Okay. Um, earlier, uh, you, I believe, Curtis, you were talking about the standard of proof. Like, how do you prove that someone got COVID from outside the workplace, since it's a presumption that it was in the workplace? Is there a standard of proof that someone could have to show that they, re that they got it outside the workplace, they contracted it outside? Uh, you know, I'm not sure what, what, what the level of proof is. I have to look that up, see if, if, if there is anything on that. Yeah, I don't even know if there whether is it's, like an answer on that yeah, one. Yeah, whether it's likely yeah. or clear and convincing or beyond doubt. I mean, I, I don't I don't know. I'd have to look that up. Yeah. I mean, I think you know, most people 
I mean, I shouldn't say that. I don't know the percentage of people. In my experience, most people, you know, they they know because they got a phone call from someone, right? And I know me personally, I don't want to ever have to make that call like, oh, guess what? Sorry, I saw you last week, Denise. And, you know, I tested positive, right? Um, but I think that most people get a phone call from someone to say, oh, so-and-so just tested positive, right? And then that's how they find out, unless, of course, they develop symptoms. I think when you develop symptoms, you may not have an idea of where you got it, you know, but you can ask the employee, you know, do you have any idea where you contracted this, right? And they go, oh, yeah, you know, I live with my boyfriend, he has it, or I was at Thanksgiving and somebody there got it or whatever, and then document that, right? I mean, you can do what you can do. There are going to be times when it's going to be a we don't know where this came from situation. Okay. But governor was really clear. It's a rebuttable presumption. Right, if they're working in you know, at a work site, that it's work related. So it's the burden is definitely on the employer to to disprove that. Okay, um, I'm looking at another question that seems to be answered earlier today. Um, for in your COVID example number one that you talked about earlier, Linda, and uh -huh. your um, an, uh, synopsis there. I thought that the employee would qualify for SFCRA because the state and local government requires quarantine due to COVID related issues. That is an awesome question because Curtis and I like went round and round on this like six months ago, yeah. like over and over again. Cause I, I said the same thing. Um, I said, I don't understand this. So Curtis, you want to take it? I mean, what? I yeah. Mean, so we, we actually had to dig into the, um, Every time there's a, a new law issued by Congress, the appropriate agency or department sets forth their own kind of like exp explanatory comments or their own regulations of how that law is going to, how, how it's going to work, how it's going to be implemented, what some of the different things mean. And so in the regulations to back up uh, FFCRA, the Department of Labor actually said that um, the person has to be exhibiting symptoms in that case, in that situation, to be eligible for FSCRA. So if, if they're just sent home because if they're not able to work because of a, a, a local order that's, that's not going to trigger FSCRA, they actually have to be sent home by, by a physician or quarantining because they have symptoms. They don't necessarily need to have a positive test. Uh, but the, the, just the, the mere fact of uh, a local order is not going to create FFCRA responsibility. Yeah. So what's going to be interesting <laughs> coming up under the new um, OSHA rules, right? Um, it's there's so many things that seem to not be congruent with one another, right? So their definition yeah. is slightly different. You also have a situation where Curtis and I talked about is. Are you really going to um, challenge if somebody is over the age of 65 or 65 or older, or they're susceptible or have a, they're in a higher risk category? You know, if they went home under the first order, I'd probably pay them the 80 hours, right? But they're still going to be 65 next week. They're still going to, you know, after the 80 hours is used up. So then what? The the interesting part under the Cal OSHA rule is when somebody goes home because of an exposure, whatever, they may be home for a really long period of time. We don't know, right? We hope not. We hope they're back soon, but there's no limit on how much you're going to have to pay them. And that's a big change also. There's none, no 80 hour limit. There's no nothing. So if you could exhaust the 80 hours under the FFCRA and still continue to have to pay them while they're out. Okay, Denise, next question. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Oh, there's still some. So uh, I'm looking at them. It's try I'm trying to go through them. There's a lot of comments and stuff too. So um, can you take disciplinary action if an employee knowingly shows up to work sick with a po without yes. a positive result? Yes. That was a firm yes. You can. <laughs> it is a firm yes. Yeah. If, if you have instructed and you stay in your your your, your COVID program here, do not come to work if you're sick, and they come to work, then they are violating your policies. You can discipline. However, you're you're playing with fire because it could be construed as you're terminating somebody because they have COVID. 
So just walk the line and be careful. So the, the form of discipline probably should not be termination. There should be other forms of discipline such as emotion, written warning, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, let's see. Regarding free testing, uh, employees with insurance will automatically get free testing, not the rapid testing. So does an employer just pay the bill for those employees without insurance? Good question. Well, I think this went back to what Curtis said earlier, right? The employer is responsible for paying it. So I would think that employers need to contact either their occupational health clinic or make arrangements with, with a service that can come out on site and test or go to people's homes or I don't know how they would do it. Um, Curtis, if somebody goes to like, um, I mean, there are free sites everywhere too, right? Um, mm -hmm. Can the employer suggest they go to one of those sites? I mean, I mean, we're all working on the fly on here, right? So we don't know how this yeah, is going to play out. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, oh. I suppose you could send them. Like the Orange County Department of Health has a site just a couple miles down uh, 17th Street from my office where you can go for free and get tested. Um, I don't see why that would be a violation. I think that would be okay. And just as long as the employee doesn't have to pay for it and doesn't come out of the employee's health insurance. I will make a note and we will do a little research. Yeah, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, okay, if employees are working from home most of the time and they drop into the office to pick up supplies, do we need to implement all the Cal OSHA COVID prevention program things that we talked about today? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. So this is implementing the, the, the rule that somebody's home where they work. I think it's uh, all the procedures of uh, if they're only dropping in the office. So you guys talked earlier about um, they didn't they weren't specific. You talked earlier about um, uh, I guess notifications if if someone's just dropping in the office if someone has COVID. Yeah, you just have to look at the the definition of exposure and see if they meet that definition. Is it 15 minutes cumulative within a 24 hour period? If someone drops in for 60 seconds to pick up a piece of mail or drop something off, and that's that's going to be less than the 15 minutes within a 24-hour period. Uh, so you just have to look at it on a case-by-case -case uh, basis. Okay. Um, let's see. We have a lot. Some of these questions are very specific, obviously, to um, question on pay data. What if we don't have 100 employees in California, but it's combined with our U U.S. offices? We do. I think that's, um, I'm not sure which I that think was it's only for question on the pay. Unless, okay. Yeah, no, I understand yeah, as far what as the I know, question is. Um, so it's just California based employees or total employees, do you know? Um, it's saying we don't have 100 employees in our California office, but combined with the US yeah, office, no, we I, do. I, yeah, no, I understand that's the question it. completely. I, did, I don't know if that's yeah. my head. Um, I, I thought it was just for California employees, but I mean, we'd have to double check that. I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, let's double Curtis check. Does. Okay. Um, a lot of questions on emailing. List. The, yeah, a lot of questions on emailing the slides. A lot of questions on getting credit. So we will make sure that we get back to you. We will send out an email with a follow up with a link to the recording and a link to the slides. And um, if we don't answer your questions now, we'll make sure that we follow up with you. Um, Let's see. Uh, for a skilled nursing facility, it was mandated that weekly COVID te COVID-19 tests must be done for all employees. The question is, who will pay for the weekly test for all the employees? I think we answered that, but why don't you answer that again? Well, there's r different rules for healthcare providers that I don't feel comfortable just addressing off the top of my head. Curtis, do you? Okay. Yeah, I I'm the same with you, Linda. I I'm not prepared to speak on the 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 regulations for the healthcare providers. Yeah, the, there's the, a like different said at the beginning, set of rules. <laughs> the, yeah, they have a different set of rules and, and union employers have a different set of rules. Okay. Um, 
people are talking about the CDC now recommends quarantine for seven to 10 days. Can we move away from the 14 day quarantine? I know you talked about that earlier. Not, not yet. Not Cross yet. our fingers, okay. knock on wood, that California follows suit. California has in the past followed the CDC when the CDC changed their guidelines. Uh, so we, we hope that we can follow the CDC, but until we do, we still have to follow the California guidelines. Okay. Um, All right, Denise, any last the, question? I'm, I'm looking yeah, at the I'm clock, it's 1240. I'm getting Everybody's hungry. Everybody's been troopers. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, Everyone's been troopers. We, have a, we do have like a couple questions, but I think they're much more specific uh, related to their individual uh, situations. So I think um, I think you guys did a fantastic job, and like I said, we'll follow up with everybody, and we'll take the questions down, and um, we'll have a, give them to Curtis and to Linda to try to follow up with you guys direct. Great, that sounds good. Curtis, thanks so much as always. Appreciate you yeah, being on this. Thank Thanks, Denise, for um, braving your evacuation plan and uh, sticking with us today. And thanks to everybody no for attending. Um, again, if you have any uh, topic ideas that you want to see in a future webinar, please drop them into the chat or email me so we can get those on the calendar. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks Thank for attending.